Let us again read God's holy word as found in Romans chapter 9, the ninth chapter of the book of Romans. And please follow as I read verses 1 through 5. Romans 9, 1 to 5, let us again hear God's holy word. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. I want to ask you to make use of your memory and your imagination, and go back in your memory and with your imagination to the days and the weeks that followed September the 11th, 2001. Most of us who are 15 years of age, or at least, or I should say older than that, most of us will still remember that beautiful Tuesday morning. Our nation was attacked. Four large aircraft were turned into deadly weapons. Two of them aimed on the Twin Towers of New York City. One of them successfully crashed into the Pentagon. The fourth, a plane that was brought down by a small group of very courageous Americans, landed in a farmer's field in Pennsylvania. Do you remember that day? I was having breakfast with a pastor friend in a little town called Eden, North Carolina, on that Tuesday morning. And I went into a shoe store after that breakfast to buy some new pads for my running shoes. I was still running a lot during those days. And because I was getting older every year, I had to keep the best of pads inside my running shoes. And I went to buy a new pair of pads for those running shoes, and two young women were standing there in the shoe store weeping, having heard the report of what had happened on that day. You remember where you are, where you were. Cities all across America began serious preparation for another possible terrorist attack. There were preparations made in Detroit, Preparations made in Philadelphia. Preparations made in Dallas. Preparations made in my home city of Roanoke, Virginia. I remember a few weeks after 9-11, after aircraft had begun to fly freely again from place to place, I had gone somewhere preaching and came back into the Roanoke, Virginia airport and walked into the airport at night and there were military men. Uh, fully clad, uh, well-armed, preparing in our small city for a possible terrorist attack. But now, use your imagination, and imagine that there was one large city that made no preparation whatsoever uh, to halt or to prevent another such attack. Imagine that with all the cities in America... Large and small, one city chose not to make any preparation. And that city was New York City. Imagine that that city, with its leaders and with its people, decided somehow that they had no need of preparation for a terrorist attack. Yes, they have to acknowledge that 9-11 happened. It was so obvious, it was so... Uh, publicized, uh, people were so much aware of it, 
Uh, and uh, they heard reports from their own neighbors, and they saw the uh, film and the photos of the Twin Towers uh, beginning to uh, smoke with those aircraft that crashed in, and they saw after a relatively short time the horrors of the Twin Towers beginning to crumble, and they even saw people jumping out of those tall buildings to their death. They acknowledge all of that. It all happened. But for some strange, <coughs> some utterly inexplicable, some utterly unreasonable way of thinking, they say, not for us. No preparation for a terrorist attack in the future on New York City. Would that have been surprising? Would it have been utterly shocking? Well, yes, of course, it would have been. And I want to submit to you, my friends, that that same kind of shock was part of the experience of the Apostle Paul when he witnessed the unbelief and the rejection of Jesus Christ by his fellow Jews. Paul was overwhelmed at times with perplexity. You see, when Paul states, as he does so clearly, that he is unashamed of the gospel at the opening of Romans, because the gospel is the power of God for salvation to all believers, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. He's not saying that, well, there ought to be some uh, logical or chronological priority given to the gospel going to the Jews. That's not the point. No, the point of Paul is much more important Paul is aware of the Jewishness of the gospel. The dominant prototype believer is who, my friends? It's Abraham. Pastor Jeremy mentioned Romans chapter 4 earlier this morning. Well, what is Romans 4? It's, it's an explanation of the faith of Abraham. Paul is concerned to demonstrate that all sinners, Jew or Gentile, are justified before God in one way, not by their works, but by faith in Jesus Christ. And it's as if he says, do we all agree? Does everyone agree that Abraham was a justified man? How was Abraham justified? Only by faith. And faith alone. That was the first, as it were, the prototype believer that Paul uses as an example. All the prophets of God who had told of the coming of Messiah were Jewish prophets. The worship ceremonies of Moses and that nation were all picturing Christ. It was all a matter of that nation, that people, being led by that man of God into a system of sacrifice and ceremony in which their sins could be passed over, in which they could have pictures of Christ held before them. The series of covenants that God made were for the most part made with Jewish people. Yes, Noah's covenant is pre-Abrahamic, but from Abraham on, it's with that nation, with those people, that God makes these extraordinary arrangements that the Bible calls covenant. The Messiah himself was the Son of God joined to distinctly Jewish humanity. The tiny substance to which the Son of God chose to unite himself was the tiny small part of the humanity of a young Jewish woman. And by the way, my friends, it isn't so much the virgin birth that we declare, it's the virgin conception. There's no question that Mary is pregnant, this young woman is pregnant. Joseph, a righteous man, is perplexed. He, he doesn't want to needlessly shame Mary. He doesn't want to be abusive to her. But he receives the report, Mary is pregnant. And Joseph makes the only conclusion that he could have made. He wasn't expected to uh, remember that there was a prophecy somewhere back in the Old Testament about a, a virgin conceiving. Don't, don't uh, put that on, Joseph. Joseph thinks in the way that any man would think. She's pregnant. She's been with another man. I can't marry her. How can I find a way to not shame her, to not abuse her, but to end this relationship? And in the midst of that, 
commendable perplexity and angst of soul, the Lord appears to Joseph and says, Joseph, the angel says, don't be afraid. That which is in this young woman is of the Holy Spirit. But who was that young woman? She was, she was a descendant of David. She was a Jewess. Well, my friends, if the gospel is so Jewish, and if Christ himself is so Jewish, how do we begin to understand the usual Jewish rejection of Christ in our own day and in the days of the apostle? And that stark, unavoidable question was, I am convinced, in Paul's mind, all the way through the book of Romans, but he particularly begins to address that question and those issues here in chapters 9, 10, and 11. Now, let me pause here to tell you how I've come to prepare what I'm going to preach to you today. I've been living in Romans, as I've told you earlier today, in teaching in several places in Africa. I've been teaching the book of Romans in three different locations. And I've made the most progress in the capital city of Rwanda, Kigali, Rwanda, and recently I was with a group of pastors who are now my dear friends. I was with them for the 11th time, and we finished Romans uh, 10 and 11. I had taught chapter 9 of Romans in the previous visit, and in this more recent visit, I had taught chapters 10 and 11. And on a Lord's Day, after having finished these chapters... I got up very early. I've been an early riser my whole life. I was telling Pastor Jeremy that my dad worked in a coal mine when I was a little boy, and I'd be the only person in the family up and out of bed when my dad went off early in the mornings uh, to work in the coal mine. Always an early riser. And uh, four weeks ago today, exactly four weeks ago today, I got up early on a Lord's Day, I'd already determined what I was going to preach in a Rwandan church there in Kigali where I was scheduled to preach. But my mind was racing ahead to the next Lord's Day when I would be back home, when I would be back in Virginia. And there was so much of Romans 9, 10, and 11 buzzing in my heart and soul that I found myself stepping back and attempting to broad stroke these three chapters of the Word of God to preach to that congregation four weeks ago today. And the Lord helped me in some measure to think about the chapters as a whole and to sketch out some kind of broad stroke analysis of the chapter. And I want to ask you to attend with me this morning these three chapters under this heading, God's Great Rescue, according to Romans 9, 10, and 11. God's great rescue, according to Romans 9, 10, and 11. Please know that I'm not attempting or claiming anything that even comes close to a thorough treatment of these three chapters. You might be thinking already of some of the verses that have perplexed you, and maybe you're thinking, well, perhaps Pastor Randy will explain those verses this morning. Well, I might not. Uh, There's going to be a lot of the verses that we will not even read. I'm not claiming that it's a thorough treatment. It's simply one small effort to hear the voice of the Spirit of God in these three chapters. Of course, let's remind ourselves that God's great rescue of sinners, like you and me, is not God's greatest purpose. Because God is God, and because we are not God, God's purpose must be first and foremost to glorify himself. I remember saying that to a young woman years ago in a counseling session, and she said, well, isn't that very self-serving, that God God wants to exalt himself? Isn't that rather selfish? Well, it is for us, but not for God. You know why? Because he's God. And you know why it's selfish and sinful for us to want to exalt ourselves, which we often do? Because we're not God. 
We are those made by God, mercifully dealt with by God. Thank God many of us this morning are those who have been rescued by God. But our deliverance, our salvation is not God's great overall purpose. His great overall consuming purpose is to display himself. Indeed, Paul comes to that at the end of this section. Look at what he says at the end of Romans 11. Oh, the depth, Romans 11, 33. Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how unscrutable are his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things to him be glory. Amen. That's the great purpose of God. From him. In his purpose, in his planning, everything, through him, by his providence, everything, to him ultimately, for his glory, everything. Why? Because he's God. John Piper has a vivid way of saying this. Dr. Piper says, God is stuck with being God. He's stuck with being God. And as God... He must pursue his glory because the exalting of God is the greatest good that anyone would ever be able to enjoy. And yet, my friends, this is extraordinary. To pursue that purpose of his own exaltation, to accomplish that grand purpose of securing his own glory, God makes the rescue and salvation of sinners like you and me the centerpiece of that purpose. It's what God puts on display. And here are the broad strokes from Romans 9, 10, and 11 about that saving purpose. Number one, God's rescue of sinners flows out of his free, sovereign choice of sinners. His rescue of sinners flows out of his free, sovereign choice of sinners. The outline is on the back of your bulletin this morning that Pastor Jeremy has provided for us. God initiates this rescue. He initiates the rescue by choosing the sinner's that he will rescue. And please, let no one say, ah, all of this talk of theologians about election and predestination, oh, this is all a great mystery. This is all a great perplexing thing that simple people like me are not supposed to understand. I'm just a simple Christian. Just tell me the story of Jesus and give me some advice on how I can serve Jesus. My friends, that's not humility. That's arrogance. That's arrogance. There is nothing here that is mysterious. There are mysteries in the Bible. The Trinity is a mystery. How can there be one God? And yet that God exists in three distinct persons. And the Father is fully God. And the Son is fully God. And the Holy Spirit is fully God. And heretics say that's three gods. And we say no. There are not three gods, there's one God who exists in three divine persons. How can that be? I don't fully understand how that can be. But the Bible reveals it. I'm not denying that there is mystery that we confront as we seek to understand the Scriptures more clearly. But my friends, what we're talking about at the moment is something that is clearly spelled out in the Bible. Look at Romans 9, beginning in verse 6. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. Okay, how do we explain all this unbelief within Abraham's natural descendants? It's not that God's word has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. And not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. 
This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. For this is what the promise said, about this time next year I will return and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also Rebekah, when she had conceived children by one man, our father Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I love, but Esau I have hated. And however you understand hated, if you understand that as not loving distinctly, not loving in the same extraordinary way, however you take that word, it's clear, God says, I made a choice. Two sons came from the same woman, and one of them, my electing purpose was set upon, but not upon the other. Now, of course, the Apostle Paul knows that we will have our objections. He knows very well that the sickening pride of the human heart will scream out, that's not fair. How do I know? The human heart cries that out because mine has cried it out. I've found that in my heart. That's what the human heart says in its response to such an idea. Well, note how Paul responds to that. Verse 19 of Romans 9. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? Wait a minute, Paul. If, if everything that's happening is ultimately the working out of God's sovereign purpose, then how can God stand back and be a moral judge? How can God stand back and accuse people? Because after all, don't they just do what God has purposed? Who can resist his will? Now, how does Paul respond? Does he say, well, it's a very complex question. Let us sit down and have a detailed philosophical discussion. And perhaps, perhaps I can find a way to explain this to you. After all, you're so intelligent and so brilliant that surely, even if I become a bit complicated, you'll be able to grasp what I'm going... Is that what you find? My friends, look at the text. Who can resist his will? Verse 20, But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to the molder, Why have you made me like this? Has not the power, pardon me, has not the potter no right over the clay to make one of the same lump a vessel for honor and another for dishonor? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for the vessels of mercy? What's Paul's response to this objection? Wait a minute. Then we're just all doing what God has planned and purpose. Well, then how can God call us into judgment? What does Paul do? Paul says, my friend, cover your mouth. My friend, shut your mouth. Bow down humbly before God. That's what the text says. That's what a spirit-guided apostle says. You see, please listen now. Please listen to what I'm about to say. The plain fact is that if God left to us the ultimate decision about the salvation of our souls, no one would ever be saved. You say, I want God to do some good things, make a way possible, Make provision, and then I want God to fold his hands and arms and let people use their free will. Do you want that? Is that what you want? I'll tell you the result of that. The whole human race plunges into judgment in hell. Election, divine election according to the Bible, 
is not a way of putting people in hell. It's God's gracious, kind way to see to it that a whole bunch of people are not going to end up in hell. That a great multitude, which no man can number, are actually going to be rescued and brought to forgiveness of sin and brought to be justified before God and brought to be genuinely sanctified and kept all the way through life to be preserved to inherit glory. It's God's way of saving sinners, even like me and you. Hallelujah. God's rescue of sinners flows out of His sovereign and free purpose in choosing sinners. Number two, God's rescue of sinners incorporates human accountability. This saving purpose, this saving program, if you will, of God, incorporates human accountability. Most of you are familiar with what I would call the tension that we have in the Bible concerning divine sovereignty and human accountability. Well, my friends, Romans 9 to 11 placards that tension. The Apostle Paul is not at all embarrassed by this. He doesn't hesitate at all to say things in this whole section that underscore this tension. The emphasis of chapter 9 is on divine prerogative in choosing. The emphasis of chapter 10 is on human accountability and human activity and human responsibility. And the emphasis of chapter 11 is on both. It's divine sovereignty in chapter 9, human instrumentality and accountability in chapter 10, and chapter 11, as we'll see in a moment, combines both realities. Look at the opening of chapter 10, brothers. My heart's desire and prayer to God for them, that is, my fellow ethnic Jews, is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own righteousness, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Why are they not saved? Paul says they refuse to submit. They refuse to submit to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Look at verse 6 of chapter 10. But the righteousness based on faith says, Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. Paul is actually quoting here from Deuteronomy 30. And in that original passage from Moses, he's really talking about the law. What is this law that God has given you? Is it something mysterious? You have to climb up into heaven to to find out what the law is? Do you have to go down deep into the earth to discover God's law? Moses says, no, it's right here. It's very plain. It's very plain. God has laid out his commandments to you. That's what Deuteronomy 30 is saying. Paul takes that passage and says, this is the way it is with the gospel. It's not mysterious. It's not hidden. It's, It's right here in front of you. Christ has come. Christ has done what is necessary to save us from our sins. Verse 9, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Look at the way the chapter ends. Verse 21 of Romans 10 but of Israel, he says, all day long I have held, my, held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. It reminds us of those eloquent words of Jesus that Luke records for us. Oh, Jerusalem! Oh, Jerusalem! How many times I've wanted to gather you as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you would not.
Let me say it very clearly and simply, my friends. No person will ever be able to say or claim, I really wanted God's salvation, but he refused to take me. No one will ever say, I, I knocked earnestly at the door of mercy. I, I, I went to the door of mercy and I, I knocked and I wanted, to, I wanted to be let in. I wanted God's salvation, but God cracked the door and looked back into his big book of decrees and said, uh, Sorry, Charlie, didn't find your name. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Yes, Jesus does say in John 6, No man can come to me. No man has the ability to come to me except the Father which has sent me draws him. But he also says, You will not come to me that you might have life. Listen, my friends. Total depravity is not an excuse for unbelief. Total depravity is a crime. Total depravity is a wickedness against God. We will never stand and talk God into seeing things our way. I wonder sometimes, and I wonder this increasingly as I talk to people. I tried to speak to a neighbor of mine several weeks ago about spiritual things and he made a response well I just don't know why all these horrible things are happening in the world if there's really a God and I, I think sometimes people have the idea that, that God is up in heaven biting his fingernails and, and that he's having anxiety attacks you know, in waiting on our, our autonomous, intelligent decisions. My friends, God never has anxiety attacks. He's never uncertain about who he is. He's never perplexed about what he's doing. He's the great, almighty, and gracious God, who even today is extending his arms of mercy in the gospel. Third, observation from these chapters. God's rescue of sinners, his rescue project, has a unique place for Abraham and his physical descendants. Now that's very clear in those opening verses of chapter 9. Verse 4, they are Israelites. To them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, the promises. But it's even more clear at the beginning of chapter 11. Note that, please. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. For I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel. Lord, they have killed your prophets, and they've demolished your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what is God's reply? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. God is still dealing with this group of people. Now, Paul takes this unique role of the physical descendants of Abraham. And he tells us here in the chapter of two exceptional functions of that role. The physical descendants of Abraham are very much part of God's ordained vehicle to bring Messiah into the world. God has revealed himself through that nation, through that nation's institutions. But Paul points to two particular things about these descendants to be noted and underscored in this passage. Number one, he points to a past jealousy. And number two, he points to a future inclusion of those physical descendants. He points to a past jealousy. Look at verse 11. 
of chapter 11. So I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles, so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Paul says, God has ordained their past jealousy as a means of bringing Gentiles in. Was that the only way that God could bring about the inclusion of Gentiles? No, but it was the way he chose. And if you're a note taker, just jot down Acts 13, 42 to 50. I won't turn there, but Acts 13, 42 to 50. And you'll see the Apostle Paul in a given situation in communicating the gospel, appealing to this principle of God using Israelite jealousy as a way of opening door for Gentiles. That's what God has done. But Paul says this place for the physical descendants of Abraham also includes something in the future. There's going to be a future inclusion of them. Verse 25 of Romans 11. Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A a partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved, as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Now some of you will know that a lot of paper and a lot of ink has been used in the debate of the best of scholars over these statements in Romans 11. Does Romans 11 tell us that there is a spiritual Israel Uh, And um, as we read what Paul says in this chapter, should should we think that he's talking about not physical Israelites, but spiritual Israelites? Well, there is there is good reason, there is at least sufficient reason for thinking that. But my best present understanding, now I say it that way because if I come back you know, next year and preach this passage again. But I'm being honest with you. My best present understanding is that Paul is here pointing to a yet future work of God in which large numbers of physical Israelites will, by electing grace, be made true Israelites by faith in Jesus the Messiah. Is it possible that this yet future revival among physical Jews is connected to the current nation state of Israel founded in 1948? That's possible. Certainly by God's providence that happened. It was an amazing providence. Whatever you may think about its fulfilling a prophecy or it not fulfilling prophecy, it was an extraordinary Providence that brought about the birth of that nation in 1948. And our president, Harry Truman, had a significant role in the decisions that were made at that time for the state of Israel to be founded. Could this yet future movement of God to bring in large numbers of Jews be connected to that nation having been raised up? Could be, but not necessarily. Not necessarily. It may be that this yet future revival will convert large numbers of Jews living in New York City or Johannesburg or Seoul, South Korea or Mumbai or somewhere in Texas. I don't think you have a lot of Jews living in Laredo, but I'm sure there's a bunch in Dallas. And a bunch in Houston. 
it seems that Paul is pointing to something that is going to happen. There's going to be a movement of the Spirit of God, and large numbers of Abraham's descendants will come to know Christ. Now, number four. God's rescue of sinners. Now, you have to listen carefully to this. His rescue of sinners entails the necessity of individual believers persevering to the end. And that necessary perseverance is enforced in this passage by divine promise and by divine, and by divine warning. Now, look at chapter 11, verse 17. And I'm going to emphasize one word as I read these verses. I'm going to emphasize the word you. And I'll tell you in a moment why. Verse 17. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishment of the olive tree, do not be arrogant against the branches. If you are... Remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That's true. They were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then the kindness and the severity of God, severity toward those who have fallen, and God's kindness to you. Provided you continue in his kindness, otherwise you too will be cut off. You say, okay, come on, Pastor Randy. What's the point? Let me tell you why I emphasize those yous. They are all singular yous. You see, in Greek, you can say you... And mean a group of people. And we can do that in English. I can say, you have come this morning to worship God. I'm referring to the whole congregation, right? Or I can say to Michael, you have come with your family this morning. And I'm referring to an individual. Well, here, the Apostle Paul uses a string of singulars. You, 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 individuals. In other words, <coughs> he pauses in his large, sweeping, salvation history mode and says, Hey, you, fella, lady, listen up. I want to talk to you. And note again, verses 20 and 21. They were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand through faith, so do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Now, how do we understand that? It's a warning. Wait a minute, don't be arrogant. Well, some people want to seize on these verses and say, well, you theologians, you big-headed theologians, you must have misread all of chapter 9, all that stuff about election and predestination, because here he's giving a warning of people uh, who, uh, who maybe end up Cutting, being cut off. Well, no, my friends, we don't alter our understanding of chapter 9. Here's the way we understand this. Listen carefully. The warning that's here. We understand this apostolic warning in this way. Those individuals who are savingly, sovereignly chosen of God to salvation must persevere in genuine faith. And part of God's ordained means to keep us in the way of faith is warning us of what will happen if we don't continue in the way of persevering faith. In other words, we come, we come to a warning like this and we receive this seriously for ourselves. Oh, there is some kind of danger. There is some kind of threat. Yes. My friend, don't say, 
Oh, I'm saved eternally. I'm secured in Jesus. I can go out and do whatever I want, and I'll still go to heaven. You go out and do whatever you want, and you live as a rebel against God, and you'll go to hell. You see, elect believers do not say, I'm elect, I'm secure. Genuine elect believers say, Oh God, oh God, why have you set your love upon me and saved me? Oh Lord, keep me by your grace as I continue to listen to your voice. Amen. Well, I come to number five. God's rescue of sinners is married to the extraordinary, passionate ministry of select human instruments. And I want you to go back to those opening verses of chapter 9 again. Because these verses reflect what I'm articulating here. That God has married... His great rescuing purpose and work, he's married that to the extraordinary, passionate ministry of some human instruments. Paul is speaking about himself. He says, I am speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. Now of what? Look at verse 2 that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers. Now, how do we understand that? Is Paul saying, I'm willing to be damned for my fellow Jews to be saved? Is he saying it that starkly? I'm ready. I'm ready to be deserted, to be given, given over to ultimate final judgment for my fellow Jews. No, Paul is not saying that. Because you see, my friends, for anyone to be ultimately given over to judgment, they've got to let go of Christ. And no believer can let go of Christ. How much when I give? How much would I give to have all of my loved ones saved? And that is what Paul is talking about here. He's, he's talking about his kinsmen according to the flesh. He's, he's not saying this about everybody. It's an amazing statement. But he's not saying it about everybody. He's saying this about his fellow Jews. I have such a burden for them that I could, I could approach the possibility but you see, Paul cannot let go of Christ. The genuine, believing, humble heart must cling to Jesus. And yet, it is amazing that Paul even begins to allow his heart and soul to be in such a realm. Oh, how much I would give. How much I would give of myself. What I would be willing to endure for their sakes. That they might be saved. And what he's saying here leads me to ask this question. Where are the Christians who at least begin to get close to Paul's example? You know, if the Lord gave me the choice of making some great sacrifice to be certain that all of my children and all of my grandchildren would be safe in heaven. I, I, I think I'd be willing to consider some great sacrifice. But what about your children? Uh, I, I don't think I'd be as ready, you know, for everybody's children. For my own, I'd be ready to do something unusual, something extraordinary. But where, my friends, I'm asking this sincerely, where 
are we going to find a few Christians who even begin to approach this level of passion for the glory of God and earnest desire for the salvation of lost souls? Well, I think the questions we have to ask are these. Will our families produce one or two Christians like that? Will your church be the means of God producing two or three Christians like that? And I'm not suggesting we should know the answers to those questions. I'm Please don't think that I'm expecting, you know, Pastor Jeremy and all of you to stand up this morning and, you know, give a loud amen. Yes, yes, we're ready. I'm only wanting as your brother and as your friend to ask the question, where will such Christians be found? You see, there is such a thing as being doctrinally orthodox, thoroughly catechized, thoroughly instructed in the best of theology, but to use good theology to isolate your heart from the transforming power of Christ. And that's not biblical Christianity. It's not Pauline Christianity. You know, I had an experience... Uh, coming back from Rwanda recently. I was there for two weeks and I didn't see a television. No exposure. I stay in this kind of a retreat center. It's a, it's kind of a conference center that a church owns in Kigali. Uh, not at all elaborate, but safe and clean. Uh, the rooms where I stay... Uh, are kind of like the rooms that you might have stayed in when you went to Christian camp. Uh, if you went 30 years ago, not many of you were all, are old enough to have gone to camp 30 years ago, but I did. And, you know, very, very plain, very simple, concrete floor, little bed, bathroom where you can take care of yourself and take a shower. Well, if, if the water's running, it usually is, but not always. The water comes and goes. And uh, I love being there. I have real friends there now. They, uh, they look after me as carefully as they can when I'm staying there. And uh, when I got back to Amsterdam... I left Kigali late on a Thursday night. I landed in Amsterdam very early on a Friday morning. The Amsterdam airport is a gathering place for the whole world. It's, it's amazing just to walk through the Amsterdam airport. People from all over the world crushing into one little place. It's fascinating. And I, I got to a place where I could get some breakfast. And... Uh, sat down in front of a television monitor, and CNN was on. It was actually broadcasting CNN from Los Angeles. You know, it's about 6 o'clock Kigali time, so it's, it's kind of late at night, uh, still Thursday night in Los Angeles, and CNN is, you know, giving the top stories of the day. You know what the top story was? What the Pope said about Donald Trump and what Donald Trump said about the Pope. And when I saw that, I thought to myself, what? This world, this world is weighed down with loads of sin, and people are starving. They're dying without food, and tragedies are rampant in so many parts of the world, and people in my country are thinking about what the Pope said about a politician, a new politician, and what that politician then said about the Pope. My friends, we are living in a world where our minds can be preoccupied with utter triviality. 
You can spend most of your time just thinking about stuff that has no eternal consequences whatsoever. And you can lose your own soul and miss the blessing of being of help to others. And yet, on this one little Sunday morning, in this small room, the Lord has called us together. And his word is an invitation to everyone without Christ to bow and believe in him. You say, Pastor Randy, wait a minute. You, you talked about election and God choosing. And, whoa, oh, I don't understand. I don't understand those things. My friend, do you understand this? Do you understand that you're a needy sinner and you need rescue? And do you understand that God has given his only son for your rescue? And are you willing to fall down before him and trust him and take him as your savior? You know, I had the joy of marrying my daughter not long ago. And I uh, marched her down the aisle. And our pastor was up on the pulpit and he read scripture and prayed an opening prayer. And then he came and sat down and I went up on the platform and married my daughter. Daniel, you have this woman, Mary Beth. Will you have Daniel? Yes. My friend, you willing to be married to Jesus? Will you have him? Will you take him? Will you say, yes, he is my Savior, he is my Lord? You say yes to him this morning, this afternoon, and he will save you. He is the Savior, and He is mighty to save. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank You and praise You that before the world began, You had formed this great, saving purpose toward our needy world and that your Son has come and done all that is necessary for our sins to be forgiven. Your Spirit has been poured out. The apostolic testimony has been recorded. And we are privileged to read it and to preach it and to believe it. Oh Lord, grant that your word will be believed again In this place, this day, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.